Hmm, I guess I would probably say that having been a therapist for many years, that talking therapy doesn't always get deep enough, um, that it is often not effective enough for people and that psychedelics are a tool to help people get down to the nitty gritty of where they really need to go and it, they can go there quite quickly. And people tend to understand that idea that, you know, um, it's a catalyst for a deeper process that can make a therapy more effective. Okay. And we're kind of used to that traditional therapy um, route where if someone has kind of a problem, they go mm -hmm. and they speak to a therapist that can be years where mm -hmm. they kind of try to walk them through what blockages and yeah. past traumas. And you were part of that mm -hmm. business for a while. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I guess what happens is people come in and they, they will tell you their story, um, the story that they may have been telling for many, many years to themselves, to other people. And actually telling that story over and over again often doesn't help. It doesn't lead to any change. They might feel better temporarily that they have someone to listen to that, but it doesn't, they don't feel themselves, they don't feel rid of that story, it stays. Right. And we see that in our, in our study because we're comparing psilocybin with an antidepressant medication and both groups get kind of talking therapy the whole way through. And we see the difference with the psilocybin group and the antidepressant group is that the, with the people with the antidepressant group, the, the story st is still there. They might find that the depression is a little bit alleviated, that the symptoms aren't so severe, but the story is still there and they still, at the last session, they'll be kind of speaking from the same place as they were at the beginning. Right. But with psilocybin, the story completely changes. It's like, the story is on this level, it's like a cognitive story, and then they dive deep in, and then they, they transform. There's, there's a, the story is like, like almost just like fragments, and, and they, the story has changed to a new story at the end of the process. So yeah, that's well, what they can do. When did you first become aware that these might be tools that, that could be used and that you might want to be, be involved with? Well, so actually, when I went to university, magic mushrooms were legal. So in, I actually lived above a shop um, called Amsterdam of London, which was in Birmingham, because um, I was at university in Birmingham. And so, yeah, we lived above this magic mushroom shop. So it was kind of, at that time, it was what people would use more than alcohol, potentially, and some, you know, some people would use that more. So that's when I was first introduced to it. Okay. Um, but that wasn't really in a therapeutic setting. And also... Um, I think, yeah, the, the mode of doing it with th ceremonially or therapeutically is, is so completely different than in a way it's almost a completely different thing. Um, but I was first introduced to the therapeutic use of psychedelics um, when my friend went to, to take ayahuasca. So when I was at university, um, she was at a different university and she left because she was suddenly... She, a depression just bowled her over, kind of felt like it kind of came out of nowhere, this really severe depression and anxiety. And she left university, moved home, was really, really struggling. So whereas the rest of our friend, you know, our group of friends were all off doing their thing in different places, she was, she was in crisis. Hmm. And she decided, after trying lots of different things and therapy and seeing psychiatrists, she decided to go and go to Peru and have ayahuasca. Um, which at the time I was really, really uh, concerned about and thought it was a really terrible idea. I didn't even know what it was. I couldn't pronounce it. I thought, you know, my sister Googled it and said she might die. And I phoned my friend and said, please, please don't do this. It's a crazy idea. You know, yeah. we can help you. We'll find another way, but don't do this. That was and the doctor and psychologist in yeah. you saying that. This is like 90s, maybe. So that was, when would it have been? Yeah, a little bit later than that. It would have okay. been like the year 2000, I think. Yeah, okay. around that time. All right. And then, um, so yeah, I felt like it was, uh, it was dangerous. And that reaction, do you still get that reaction from many Other doctors people. and psychologists? Yeah. Okay. And is that the official reaction of, say, like the NHS to this stuff? Or? Unfortunately, at the moment, well, it's changing now, but it, it has been. Um, so with my, with my cohort of clinical psychologists, everyone I trained with, um, there was one person out of 42 that was a little bit interested in psychedelic work, but mo most of the others, when I've talked to them about it, have, have you know, felt that maybe it overwhelms the defences too quickly if they're more psychoanalytically trained. Or, you know, if people work in CBT, they might feel that they, they really believe in the model that they're using and that this is it's also potentially quite threatening if something is coming along that's claiming to... 
I think part of it is that there's a threat if if there's a whole industry around therapy and something's coming along saying, hey, that we're much more effective, that's threatening. Right. But there's also that idea of like the the kind of quack saying, hey, I can fix the magic cure, I can fix you in a day. And that quite rightly, they're a bit suspicious about that because they know that trauma takes a long time to heal and they are, they're protective of their patients, their clients. They don't want them to be... Um, you know, fall into some kind of quackery, right. and that's what we're we're really trying to show with our research that it's that it's this is real change. This is real, deep, scientifically backed um, transformational process. Right. Yeah. Okay. So back to two thousand. You said don't go. She went anyways. She went anyway. She and sold her car, I think, so okay. that she could afford to go, um, and she came back, and she just. You know, it's the the eyes, the light in the eyes. When someone has, when someone is really suffering from depression, and you see the light kind of going out, and that they, there's that kind of disconnection and flatness, and they 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 try and do something about it, but they just can't. And she came back, and it was like the light had the light switch had been turned back on again, and she just was radiating her her true self, her old self, the way she always has been. We grew up together as neighbours. She was just back to her old, old self and she's still now, she's still well now. 